The emperor met his brother Jerome again at Genoa after the reconciliation of the two brothers at Alessandria. Jerome had been promoted to the rank of commander. He was entrusted with the mission to go with a squadron of vessels to Algiers and there to summit of the day to hand over to him the Genoese who had been kidnapped by the Barbary pirates and who had remained their prisoners. Having become our fellow citizens, the Genoese had a right to the immediate protection of France. The name of Bonaparte and the commander's firmness triumphed over that day. Who had at first refused obedience? Jerome, within a month after leaving Genoa, brought back to that port all the Genoese and Italians whom he had just rescued from the hardest slavery. This fortunate expedition endeared him to the people of Genoa, who hailed his return with transports of gratitude. The emperor, in spite of the eight days spent in Genoa in the midst of rejoicings, did not lose sight of business. After all, he was constantly preoccupied concerning the war against England, which had been the principal motive of his accepting Genoa. He left this city with the Empress for Turin, where he stayed one day. The extraordinary powers of the Arch-Chancellor having lapsed after the union of the Genoese Republic to the Empire. This high dignitary was maintained there in the capacity of Governor-General. The emperor on his journey back to Paris visited the convent of mont where the monks had prepared luncheon for him. This was his only halt till he reached Fontainebleau, towards which he pressed forward with full speed, always accompanied by Josephine, who bore the fatigues and the privations inseparable from such rapid traveling with remarkable endurance. It would have been useless for the emperor to try and spare her. She was indifferent to the length of the journey and the absence of all the comforts to which she was accustomed, so long as she was not separated from Napoleon. In this hurried journey, escorts of under-officers, grenadiers, and chasseurs of the guard had been formed to accompany the emperor's carriage. But so fast was the pace that none of them were able to keep up with the carriage to the end. The emperor thanked them for their zeal, and after that time, the experiment was not renewed. I think it my duty as a truthful historian to relate the one occasion during the many years which I passed near his person on which he was rather seriously vexed with me. It will also serve to throw a new light on Napoleon's character. I had been attached to his cabinet for close upon three years. During that time, I had received proof of his kindness and his satisfaction with me. No cloud had come to overshadow my relations with him. When their serenity was suddenly troubled by a particular circumstance, since the rupture of the peace of Amiens, the work in the cabinet had greatly increased. The hard work to which I was constantly subjected woke in me in an irresistible desire for some amusement. Too young as I was, I was then 27 years old. I was wanting in maturity. I had too little ambition and care for the future not to take advantage of the few hours of leisure which were left to me and which I was able to snatch from the sedentary and monotonous life which I was leading. The opera master ball was then at the height of fashion. Napoleon himself used frequently to visit it. I often went there and found some people of my acquaintance with whom I got accustomed to foregather. That led to our arranging dinner and theater parties. Once or twice a week, we used to dine at the Robert restaurant. There never being more than eight or ten people at the table. The honors were done by one or two ladies of the class it is usual to call amiable ladies. As fate would have it, most of the men I used to meet at these parties were not in the emperor's good graces. Amongst them was a former moderate Conventional, his compatriot, and the friend of all his family, whom I had known for a long time. A keen and clever man, dissatisfied, but incapable of doing any harm. I obtained for him later on a place in the civil service, and he was appointed to a subprefecture in Piedmont. He conducted himself with so much skill and loyalty that the emperor, considering the place he occupied was beneath his merits, put him down for a prefecture. 
The others were bankers, of whom some had been crossed in their speculations by the general measures of the government, but who, in spite of that, were not hostily disposed towards it. Although they thought that they had a right to complain, they had sufficient tact not to speak to me of their grievances, to which, in no case, could I have listened. I gave myself up to these innocent pleasures without dreaming of the storm which was gathering over my head. One day, when I had been to see the Empress Josephine, she happened to speak to me of the opera ball, of certain meetings which the Emperor had made there, and which rather excited her jealousy. She added jestingly that she knew I was in the habit of seeing a very amiable person there. She complimented me upon my taste, said that she knew her name, and that she was sure that it was because her Christian name was Josephine also that I had chosen her. I denied that I had any such influence with this lady, as she described, and begged her to tell me how she had got to know about these matters. She was good enough to tell me, without a moment's hesitation, that it was Bonaparte who told her. That gave me cause for reflection. The emperor's silence towards me, considering how fond he was of joking, surprised me. Then, on thinking the matter over, I felt hurt by this mysterious conduct and determined to wait until he spoke of the matter to me. Two days later, I met him walking with Dr. Corvisar in a covered alley which led out from the family drawing room at St. Cloud. As I passed before them, the emperor barred the way and catching me by the arm, looked at me with mocking eyes and said to Corvisar, Here, after all, is a man whose usual company is that of my enemies. I was prepared for this sally by what I had heard from Josephine. I was reassured by the rough frankness which the emperor had used in speaking to me. I ought not to have taken the matter in earnest, but dissatisfied in my mind with Napoleon's silence towards me, which implied a sort of suspicion. I answered him very seriously that I had had no occasion to see that this accusation was a well-founded one, that if the persons whom I associated with were really his secret enemies, they would find themselves in the wrong box with me, that he could not doubt my loyalty, and that I was not the man to allow anything concerning him to be even hinted at in my presence." He allowed me to speak without interruption, and I withdrew, seeing that he had nothing to add to what he had said. Corvisar, who at first had been surprised at the way in which the emperor had spoken to me, took my part and said with a laugh that he would willingly go bail for me. The day passed without any allusion being made to what had happened in the morning. Till then, my absences had been tolerated, and it sometimes happened that I did not return to the cabinet until the following day. I always managed to get there before the levee, which took place at nine o'clock. When the emperor crossed his cabinet to go to his levee, I had always taken care that his papers should be in order, and the letters which had arrived in the morning opened and arranged on the little table which stood by the cité where he usually sat. He used to give a glance at them as he passed, but never stopped unless I told him there was something important and urgent in the day's letters. I do not know whether some police reports had put the friendly meetings about which I have spoken in a false light, but from the moment when I knew that the emperor had been informed of these meetings, I found that he got to the cabinet before me. I also learned that he had frequently asked for me after dinner when I was away. It looked as if he was trying to get together as many causes for complaint as possible so as to have all the more right to burst out. The explosion which took place in the nick of time was brought about by a parcel which I had sent off by a courier and which for some reason or other was not punctually delivered at its address. One day on my arrival at the cabinet, a Hussier told me that the emperor had asked for me in an excited tone of voice. Just as the Hussier was going away, the emperor made his appearance. He addressed me in a very animated way and with an anger which seemed feigned rather than real, reproached me for my neglect of his cabinet, adding that I paid no attention at all, that I was constantly absent, that I absolutely neglected his affairs, and that an important dispatch had been lost by my fault. Then, without waiting to hear any explanation from me, he went out to call the courier and shouted out to him that all his anger could suggest on the subject. Then, returning, he brusquely opened 
all the packets which were on his writing table. He told me that he did not wish me to open his letters in future, and that without having any doubts of my loyalty, he should not be able in future to trust himself to my vigilance. All this was said and done with so much volubility and precipitation that I was unable to get in a single word. I had never before seen him in such a state of excitement. After this scene, he went off to his levee and thence to breakfast and did not show himself again. A few minutes before dinner time, I was summoned into the little drawing room which adjoined his cabinet where I found him working with the Secretary of State. Napoleon rose on my entrance and approached me with a calm and composed air. In the presence of the minister, he gave me a really paternal lecture, speaking to me of the confidence which he had placed in me, of my duties, of the honor attaching to their right fulfillment, of my future, of all the good he wished me, and so on, speaking to me with so much kindness that, although I had made up my mind to listen to him coldly, I could not help feeling very much touched. He told me that it was necessary that I should cease my absences because he would have to work all the week. As a matter of fact, he came to his cabinet in the evening, remaining there a quarter of an hour before calling me. When I came into his summons, he received me in the most cordial manner possible, calling me his dear men of all dear little men of all, in a term of friendship, which he often used towards me, made no further allusion to the grievances of the day and tried to make me forget them. There ended this quarrel, which was never renewed during the long years which Providence destined me still to pass with him. I never ceased to find him good, patient, and indulgent in his treatment of me. I had occasion afterwards. I do not remember in what connection to allude to this scene. My dear men of all, he said, there are circumstances in which it is necessary for me to put my confidence in quarantine. The emperor's attack upon me was without doubt of a nature to hurt my feelings, but to a certain extent it was justifiable. On reflection, I was forced to acknowledge that if sometimes storm arise in the most peaceful minds, and those least exposed to the tempests of life, one cannot be astonished that a keen and ready spirit so susceptible to impressions, so agitated by so many and such various thoughts, should, in circumstances of little importance, have paid its tribute to the imperfections of human nature. The business, the papers which Napoleon entrusted me with were sufficiently important for him to feel anxiety as to their safety. Besides, although this superior man was not insensible to pinpricks of everyday life under great reverses, he always remained self-controlled, always calm, always serene, and armed with all his presence of mind. So I bore him no ill will for what had happened, and neither did he towards me. I may remark, however, that the subjection to which I was constrained seemed to me harder to bear than ever. On the morrow, the emperor's letters were left unopened on his writing table. On his entering the cabinet, he opened one or two and handed me the rest, saying in a tone of some impatience, Minival, open these letters. I touched none of the letters which arrived subsequently. I had often thought that my work was already very heavy and I did not want to see it increased. I made up my mind to take advantage of this scene which had occurred to get rid of a supervision and a task which, in proportion, as business increased, became more and more fatiguing. The duty of opening the sovereign's letters involved their classification according to the minister's concern and the drawing up of a summary on the margin of each communication. Now... Very often, there was no time for this work. I was constantly being interrupted in it to write at the emperor's dictation. I will not speak of the responsibility which would have rested on me to a certain extent, supposing some dispatch had been removed or diverted from its destination or even had got simply lost. Already in 1803 and 1804, when the English ambassadors in the residences the least distant from our frontiers, were acting as the agents of disorder and intrigue and even corruption. I had suggested to Napoleon how necessary it was that the safety of his dispatches should be provided for. He contented himself with giving me a mounted escort on his journeys between La Malmaison and Paris, which were always made very late in the evening. And this was only done to prevent the carrying off of his portfolio. 
In drawing these reflections to a close, I will add that the emperor gradually accustomed himself to open his letters himself. I helped him in this task when I had nothing more urgent to do. His devouring cerebral activity, which never could find enough food and which grew as the demands upon it increased, was all sufficient. As soon as a letter had been opened, he read it and often answered it at once, putting the others aside to be answered later and throwing all those which did not need an answer on the floor. Sometimes the ministers sent to ask me what the emperor had done with such or such a report. When they heard that he had thrown it aside without an answer, they knew what it meant. Napoleon used to call not answering the best part of his work. When he was away, I was charged with opening the letters which might come during his absence, and in case they contained anything urgent to take them to him, wherever he might be, or to hand them to him immediately on his return, even in his private apartments. This custom was established in this way and was afterwards observed. The little festivities and amusements of which I have spoken to the reader and which had given offense to Napoleon were broken off by a series of incidents and by the absence of the emperor on a journey in which I had to accompany him. This episode, which I could not pass over in silence, has interrupted the course of my narrative. May I be allowed to resume it? The Bologna expedition was ready, and all the vessels were prepared to set sail. Repeated exercises in embarking and landing had trained the troops to precision and speed without confusion. So necessary in this kind of expedition. Each regiment, each brigade, each army corps had its appointed post and knew on what ships to embark. The most minute instructions had been given to the land forces as well as to the sailors. The winds which were wanted to blockade the English ships in their ports and clear the seas were favorable. Terror reigned in the councils of the cabinet of London. England, trembling on her island, scattered gold broadcast and used all the resources of her diplomacy to divert to Austria or to Russia, the most imminent danger to which she had ever been exposed. The maneuver, the success of which was to bring together at the mouth of the channel sufficient naval forces to ensure a free passage to the Bologna flotilla had succeeded. By skillfully combined maneuvers, Napoleon had succeeded in assembling in distant waters the largest part of the fleets of France and her allies. I must add in passing that he did not always find in his minister of marine the assistance which his ignorance of the element which was the scene of his plans rendered necessary. The responsibility which rested on this minister on the eve of undertaking so colossal a maritime expedition rendered him almost constantly negative. This officer, who was so brave at sea, was timid and hesitating in the council. This circumspection might have reacted on the admiral who was charged with the chief command, had not his irresolution an absolute want of strength of character, although he was a brave man. Suffice to paralyze the efficaciousness of the resources at his disposal, the minister's hesitation, and the admiral's tergiversation provoked the emperor's impatience in the highest degree. Now discouraged, now gaining confidence, as news came in from the sea, he ended by doubting as to the success of the expedition, and yet all the preparations had been completed. The emperor, a prey to all the torments of incertitude, was still clinging to the hope that at any moment he might hear of the appearance of the fleet which he was expecting with such impatience. When he heard that his hopes were shattered by the news of Admiral Villeneuve's entry into Cadiz, where he was blockaded by superior forces, all illusion had then to be abandoned, and Napoleon had nothing else to think of than to prepare for the imminent continental war with which he was threatened by Austria. He determined, in consequence, to break up the camp at Bologna, faithful to his custom, to use his own expression, of always doing his work in two ways. He had given secret orders with the object indicated, without, however, making it apparent that he despaired of the success of the expedition, and finally had dictated to Monsieur de Talleyrand directions for the drawing up of his manifesto.